we would probably actually take this talk outside and do it out there because it's so nice out. But I don't know if the sisters of Dominica would appreciate me cutting down some of their trees in the woods back here. So we will just stick to plan A, which is doing this indoors. And um, just to give you some background of, of where I'm coming from on giving this talk, when I was 14, my dad and mom bought a, a piece of land in southern Iowa, 110 acres of timber for recreation for us to go hunting at and camping and and the thing, my dad was a wildlife biologist, so, um, and land was really cheap at that time. And so we, we kind of got started with, with forest management, uh, at least for me at an early age. And um, this was before I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. Actually, I think I wanted to be an NBA player at that time. But I ended up being a forester instead. And we, we started out with a 27-acre TSI project, doing some thinning work on that property. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth on learning how to run a chainsaw from watching dad do it. And it, it didn't come until later in life that dad had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> so as I grew into being a professional forester and was exposed to some trainings on chainsaws, I realized how little I knew and how little we all knew between my brother, I have two brothers and my dad and, and our friends who would come help us when we cut firewood down at the, the timber as we called it. And, uh, and I got more and more into the, the training and I realized, wow, this is really cool and I should really share this with as many people as I can because it's a safety thing. Um, I, I work on a daily basis with landowners out in their woods and they're asking me to tell them which trees to cut and which ones not to cut. And I don't always feel comfortable telling a landowner, well, you should cut this tree right here when I don't know what their background and their skill levels are with running a chainsaw. So it's kind of a scary thing for me. So, that's, that's why uh, I like doing this talk. I did the same talk last year and, and we decided to do it again. And so this, hopefully you can all relate to that. You've maybe got a few acres or uh, even 100 acres of woodland and, and you like cutting firewood. Uh, you might be doing some timber stand improvement where you know, you've got trees marked for thinning or other reasons. You might be doing some custom log production or like the picture over on the right, you, know, you may have some trees that are along a road or maybe near a cabin or your home that occasionally need to be dropped and you'd like to know how to go about doing that. So that's who the program's for. Just to give you a quick outline of the program, we're gonna talk quite a bit about the felling, the methodology of felling and how you set that, that up. Uh, I'm gonna cover basic saw maintenance. We don't have enough time to go into everything that I'd like to in detail. And towards the end, if we've got enough time, we'll try to cover what I call your common pickle situations. When you get into a pickle in the woods, like you get a tree hung up, or you get a spring pole that's developed and how to deal with that. I don't know if we'll have time to get to that stuff. And I'm not really a big safety guy, so safety comes last in this talk. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Safety's always first. That's, that's kind of the whole premise of the talk. Um, so I, I wanted to find some statistics and information on chainsaw injuries, like from OSHA. And, of course, I didn't think ahead, and I, go, I just entered that search term into Google, chainsaw injuries, and all these disgusting photos pop up on the screen of uh, people with mauled faces and missing body parts. But I came to this, this graph and it just shows where most injuries occur on the body and far and away the lead is the arm and hand area with 18,000. This is a, I suppose it's a, a per year type of statistic, but uh, the dots are what matter. Um, the legs are the uh, very close second in that injury chart and then head injuries uh, feet and upper body areas kind of all come in about the same. So this is, this is real basic stuff. I don't like to dwell on it. Um, you got to have these pieces of equipment if you're going to be safe and you're going to be running chainsaws in your wood. A uh, helmet, that, or as bicyclists call them, brain buckets. You should have one of those. Eye and ear protection. It's, there's nothing worse than getting a piece of sawdust stuck in your eye and not being able to get it out. And the ear protection is just for that chronic uh, issue of, of hearing loss. And then chaps or some kind of chainsaw resistant pants, they actually make full pants that you can put on that'll protect your, your body from those. Um, boots and gloves, uh, common sense stuff. And then some basic things, it's really, I, I'm very guilty of this when you're running a chainsaw and you've got your thumb on the grip, kind of like, you know, your thumb sticking out, kind of like you're cruising the loop when you were in high school or, or as they do. And uh, that offers real weak 
protection from kickback injuries. So you should have your thumb gripped all the way around that handle, like you're holding on to the roller coaster ride on its way up the hill. Not in a death grip, but with your thumb around that with a, an encircling grip on the top handle. Use that chain brake. A lot of people are afraid to put their chain brake on because they think it invokes wear and tear on their chainsaw, but it's, it's there for a reason. And uh, whenever you're pull starting the saw, there's a chance there if you've got compression built up in the engine that that can kick back as it starts and hit you somewhere. And then whenever you're walking from one tree to the next. And another one that I'm guilty of is if you haven't been keeping your saw tip top, the carburetor, the air cleaner clean, and the thing wants to die sometimes, it doesn't want to idle very well, and you're walking from one tree to the next, you keep it revved up so that it doesn't die. And uh, that's, that's not, a good, not a good thing to do in case you trip and you've got that chain moving. Whenever you're cutting and whenever you're throttling that engine, keep, you should have you know, your feet firmly planted with weight distributed. So another one I'm guilty of, but um, you get in a hurry and you, you're leaning out one way or you, you're, you're still finishing your walk as you approach a branch to cut. Um, just take your time, be real conscious of that, and, and wait until you get positioned before you start cutting. Bend at the knees, not the back, and work with the saw in close to your body. So don't be reaching out like this. That's, that's just, these are chronic things to save, you know, they'll let you work longer into the day and, and not feel so sore the next day and um, keep, your, keep your back strong. All right, that's all I'm going to do on safety. And then we're going to get right into uh, the talk about felling methodology. And so this line right here is something I've never forgot. Every tree deserves a plan. The first chainsaw safety training I ever took uh, this logger from Wisconsin who'd been at it for over 25 years taught this class. He'd, he'd spent his whole career logging, never had any issues, at least nothing major. He had all of his body parts. And he had retired from logging and was now doing these safety trainings. And he said, every tree deserves a plan. And that was big for me because I thought, man, loggers are, uh, I can't say the, uh, Loggers, I, I figured they're all about productivity and just going. And, you know, they probably crank through the woods and cut tree after tree after tree, and they're not even, they're so good, they don't even have to look up. They're just boom, 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 boom. But to hear a logger who'd been at it in the state of Wisconsin for almost three decades say, every tree deserves a plan, that, that put a light bulb off in my mind. So we're going to spend a little bit of time going over what that means. What, what is the plan? Every time you're going to cut a tree down, you need to go through these, these items. First and foremost, is just looking up at that tree and figuring out which way it naturally wants to go. That's going to be based on things like which way it's leaning, where the weight is distributed in that tree, and then if you've got any big gusty winds blowing that day. Uh, this is really 90% of, of safe tree felling. There's only so much you can do. Some of you may have come to this talk thinking, yeah, I know the tree wants to lean and fall on my house, but I want to cut it down the other way. There's only so much you can do to circumvent physics. And so um, in a beginner's course like this, I'm just going to barely touch on a little bit of that. But this is the, this is the main thing, is, is you still got a ton of weight up there that you're chopping down to the ground, and, and you need to be safe. So we look up at every tree, see which way it's leaning. You know, you could use a, a plumb bob of some kind if you needed to really try to figure this out. In the woods, this is tougher because there's all kinds of other trees in the area that you have to look through. But which way does that tree lean? And then maybe you would want to draw kind of a fictitious outline around the crown to see which way the weight is distributed on that tree. And that weight is going to pull that tree a certain way. Sometimes you'll have both things interplaying, like the tree's leaning this way, but its weight goes back the other way. And you have to really stare and stop and think about, well, which one's going to overcome? Is it the lean or the weight? The next thing you come to is, OK, I know which way the tree wants to go, but which way do I want it to go? And do those two mesh? So the, the two basic simple things here is, you know, we want to put the tree down wherever there's room for the tree to go down cleanly, and we want to do it without damaging other trees. So in this picture, my blue slash marks indicate trees that are going to be cut in a thinning operation, and then the highlighted trees are ones I want to protect. I don't want to do damage to those. So you have to really be honest with yourself and say, can this be done? Is there room for that tree to go down? If it's not possible, that you just got to stop right there and you got to come up with plan B. Maybe that tree's not going to come down today. 
Maybe you're going to have to come back with a bucket truck, if, depending on what your situation is. If you're just in a thinning project, like a forest stand improvement project, you may just resort to girdling that tree and letting it die standing on the stump. So it, it's, this is another thing I learned from that logger, because I thought that you know, maybe there was some magic we could pull and, and make trees fall down, and that's just not the case. If it's really entangled and intertwined up there, or if the tree's leaning the wrong way, there's no way of around, getting around that, unless you've got a skitter with a, a winch and, or a tractor with a winch. So assuming that the first two items are satisfied, we can move on to the third. And then that is that's an important one. I, we're identifying potential hazards in that tree. So we're looking up, we're looking for hangers, we're looking for widow makers, big dead branches like that that could fall out as that tree tips, dead limbs that might still be attached in that tree that when you start vibrating that trunk by cutting into it, you could be shaking those branches free and they can land on you. This is a really important one, intertwined branches. This one kills a lot of loggers and, and gets a lot of people injured. So you, the tree you're cutting has branches that wrap behind it and connect it to another tree or they're lodged behind another tree. And as your tree falls, those branches try to hold your tree and then eventually they break and come down. And sometimes it, they, it takes them 10 seconds, 15 seconds or more before those branches come down and you're standing around admiring your work and, and a branch falls right next to you and it's quite scary. Uh, vines can also cause problems in that way. They, they hang on to the next tree over and keep the tree from falling cleanly. So we usually try to cut any vines that are on the tree before we uh, take it any further. And then these last two things, cracks or rot and decay. So you're looking at the, the base of the tree and if you're familiar with rap music from the 90s, when it was at its best, uh, <laughs> There was a song by Sir Mix-a-Lot about how he liked big butts, and that's fine for rappers. But for loggers, that's, that's a warning, that's an alarm. And when you see a tree, you know, most trees have a natural flare at the base where the roots start to bend sideways. Well, that's, that's typical in the bottom 12 inches or so of a, of a normal tree, that root flare. When you see a swollen butt on a tree that goes higher up than a couple of feet, like this one, if you can see that, that's a warning sign. That's usually a sign of, of some internal decay and rot. So there's been fire scars that chewed away the heartwood of that tree or maybe grazing. A lot of times it's due to livestock and grazing and they end up being hollow on the inside. And hollow trees are the, some of the most dangerous ones because you don't have the control on your felling of that tree as, as you would if that tree was solid, had a solid core. All right, this is an important one too. Identify your escape route. So as the tree's falling down, your goal is to get away from it. You don't want to stand around and just be next to the stump because things can happen. It can kick back, it can roll to the side. And so your escape route, it doesn't mean like I'm fleeing and I'm escaping in an emergency. It means just how am I going to get away from that tree as it's going down? And it's, it's simple. You don't want to go off to the side at 90 degrees. You don't want to go backwards directly behind the tree where uh, it could come back. You want to escape the tree, retreat at a 45 degree angle on either side. So it could be the, the right side or the, the left side, but you're going to come away from that tree at a 45 degree angle. And this is one that you have to look at too, because what you're going to have to do is every tree that you're going to fall, you got to make sure there's no obstacles or trip hazards in that zone of retreat. So for instance, on this tree, um, my arrow here points shows the felling direction. If you were standing right in front of this tree like you are in the audience and the tree was gonna come right at you, look at all that brush and, and treetops and stuff piled up against the base. I, basically, it's gonna take me five, 10 minutes, but I need to clear a path at a 45 degree angle from the backside of that tree so that I can get away from it. Take, the, take that time to do it. Just like that. All right, and then lastly, and this one is a little bit more difficult to, to explain, but every tree, once you've figured out which way you want it to go or which way it wants to go, then you stand there and look up and it's gonna typically have one, what we call good side and one bad side. And that just refers to if there's side lean or an imbalance of weight or wind blowing on it from 90 degrees to the direction you're gonna drop it. So the concept is that, you know, if, if this tree's going away from us, the way that arrow points, and we look up in that tree, see how there's 
this one big heavy branch that comes off to the right, that's going to invoke some side lean. So I'm going to call that the bad side, and the left side would be the good side of the tree. And this, this is just something the loggers say is a little bit more advanced, because, and they say this, maybe not save your life someday, but it'll save you chainsaws. Because a lot of times as that tree goes down, if something goes wrong, uh, it'll, it'll end up pitching your saw or landing on your saw. So this is uh, kind of the next thing. So as you're making the final cuts in your tree and as you're operating on it, you want to stand on the good, your escape route you'd want to make on the good side of that tree. So that's it, just uh, those five things. Remember, every tree deserves a plan. Don't forget that lesson. Which way does the tree want to go? Where do you want it to go? And then make sure those two things are in alignment. Identify your hazards, clear your escape route, and then figure out which is your good side and bad side. And then you're going to start surgery on that tree from that good side. All right, so I'm going to shift now, and we're going to go actually into the, the nitty gritty on the, the principles here of these felling cuts. So when I was 14 and watching my dad cut these trees, I would basically stand back and watch him. And he would cut this Pac-Man shaped, you know, like out of the mouth of Pac-Man uh, wedge out of the tree. And then he would come in and cut it from behind. And I would internalize that and think, OK, I get it. You just make a, a notch there. And then since there's no wood there, the tree must fall that way. How many people think that still? <laughs> It's kind of close to the truth, but it's not exactly why it happens that way. So what I'm going to teach you is what industry calls the open face notch or the hinge method. And the hinge, that word is the important one to remember. And these terms are easy to get confused in your mind. A, a notch, a wedge, a hinge. Try to, try to do your best to keep these terms straight. The hinge is what it's about. Think of a door hinge, like on these doors. That hinge swings that door open, so keep thinking about that. So uh, the Forest Industry Safety Training Alliance, FISTA, and the Game of Logging are two of the, the better training programs in the country. This is what they teach exclusively. This method gives you total control of that tree when it's used properly. However, there's a trade-off with some of the volume on that butt log of the tree, and that butt log is always the most valuable part of the tree. And so for that reason, there's a lot of loggers out there that, that just choose not to use this method because if you're cutting a $5,000 or $10,000 black walnut, you kind of hate to lose uh, you know, a foot off the bottom of that stump. But um, these training organizations feel that because it's a safer cut and because you have so much better control over the direction of that tree falling, you're over time, you know, saving, you save time in trees that get, got hung up or trees that broke on their way down. It's, it's more production, it's more efficient, and more profitable by using this method. <clears throat> All right, why does it work? Uh, to say that wood has high longitudinal strength or tension is kind of nebulous. You don't really know what that means. But imagine a twig in your hand, and you try to pull that twig apart. It, it would be very difficult to do. So wood is very strong in that direction. But if you bend it and try to snap it in half, that's pretty easy. So the hinge, by creating a hinge, uh, by leaving a strip of wood about one to two inches thick all the way across the stump, that's what we're going to call the hinge, that's strong enough to hold that tree up until you're ready for that to, to bend sideways and snap that way. That's why this, this method works. That hinge controls the direction that the tree is going to fall. And it's not to be confused with this activity, which this is a lot of people now are using this term hinge cutting to improve, well, to change the way their property works for white-tailed deer. So they'll go in and just kind of massacre a bunch of trees by cutting them through the back and letting them stay connected. And that's what they're calling hinge cutting. And that, that may be fine in some situations, but you do not want to be doing it on trees of this size. That's, that's very, very dangerous. That's what, this is what we call barber chair. And by cutting into a tree from the back, yeah, it goes down a lot faster, but it's, it's extremely dangerous. So it's not that. I'm going to go, go over real quickly just kind of the three basic cuts. Um, the open face notch, the bore cut, and then the final back cut. So the notch, and again, try to remember to keep these terms straight. The notch, think of like if you just had a board and you needed to cut a notch of wood out of it so that it would bend better. That's what you're doing with your, when you're cutting out a notch. 
You're just, all you're doing is getting rid of that piece of wood. You're getting it out of the way. It's wood that you don't want in there and, and you're just trying to get it out of the way. All right, the bore cut is, is the one that most people have trouble with learning and practicing when they're first doing this. This is where you're taking your saw and you're turning it sideways and you're using the very tip of the bar to plunge lengthwise right, into the, right through the middle of the tree and you're gonna hollow out the center of that tree. And what that does is that, that creates that little strip of wood that we're gonna explain as the hinge. So we leave a little bit of wood right between those two and then we leave a little bit of wood in the back that's called holding wood and then eventually we'll come in and make the final back cut. And there's, there's our hinge. So if you think about a, a cylinder like a tree trunk, as a, even though it's technically a cone, and we inserted a door hinge right in that spot, think about how that closes. There's, because of the way that wood holds itself up with that longitudinal strength, there's no way that tree can go except for to close on that hinge. All right, so I've got a little animation here to just kind of show how this works. So imagine that the tree hasn't been cut. That, that blue area is the, the actual tree that you're coming in. And we start on the, the side of the tree that we're wanting to drop it. And we make some cuts coming in. All right, and we cut out that, that notch. That's that hunk of wood that we just discard. We're getting it out of the way. That's, that's initially what sets the direction of fall because that is the, the leading edge of the hinge that that tree's gonna fold over on. Then we're gonna come back here and do our bore cut. And this, this saw will go in, you'll see it it used the tip of the bar, but you're using the bottom half of the tip of that bar. And I'll explain that more in a minute. But you're just getting that, that bottom tip inserted, and then you straighten that saw out so that you can get that tip buried. And then you're basically just plunging that saw directly all the way through that tree so it pokes out on the other side. And you'll see there's a little bit of an angle to this. It angles away in this direction, away from where that hinge wood is, because a common mistake with this is to actually accidentally cut through that hinge wood and you want to stay far enough away that you don't cut through that hinge wood. Then you can bring the saw back around to straight to, to set that uniform thickness of the hinge and pull that saw back out. So now you see we're left with that uniform width, that's our hinge. And right now that's holding that tree up real solidly. Then we can actually just put the saw right back in to our bore cut, but you can see and start working the saw backwards towards the back of the tree. And then typically take the saw back out and leave. So we've got a chunk of wood holding it up back here and a chunk of wood holding it up right there. And that's what we call the holding wood in the back. And then it's basically just as simple as, as finishing that cut. Now you could actually, uh, while your saw is in this middle part, you could just cut straight on out the back. And by the time you get down to almost no wood left, that tree's going to go. But the traditional way is to, to teach it like this and come in from the back so that you can get away from the tree. And then that's when that tree goes. So you're going to retreat from the tree at a 45 degree angle on the good side of that tree. Try to get behind some other big trees in the area if you can. That's a, just a good protective um, buffer between you and that stump. And then pay attention for limbs coming down. That's the thing. As the tree goes down, even a, a few seconds afterwards, kind of look up and make sure there's nothing coming for you. All right. There's some mathematical and physics equations that you just have to be aware of in, in creating these cuts. How deep should the notch be? How far back into the tree do you make this initial cut? And the technical answer is over here on the right. It, it, the, when you measure the width across the face of that notch, you should be 80% of the, the DBH, the diameter at breast height. So if that tree you were cutting down was 10 inch DBH, you should have an eight inch measurement across the front of that notch. The more easy general way to say it is don't come you know, clear back to the middle of the tree, but say about a third. You're gonna come about a third of the way back from in this, in this dimension. All right, that angle on that notch should be somewhere between 70 and 90 degrees, and that's, that's how it's defined as open face. That seems like overkill. Why do we need to make that wide of, a, of an angle? The reason is just because you don't want anything interfering with this space as the tree goes down. 
So if that tree goes down and that space closes too fast, that, that can cause some kickback. So by doing it this way, by creating that real wide opening, there's nothing that, that impedes that. 90 degrees is best. And you think, how the heck do you get 90 degree openings on a tree that's straight up and down? You can do it a couple of ways. You can come in 60 degrees plus 30 from the bottom. If you've got a bunch of root flare on that tree, you could actually come straight down that root flare and then straight out zero degrees from the side. So it's quite a bit different than the old cut a wedge of cheese out like Pac-Man and the tree falls that way. All right, one thing that's critical here is you can't have any bypass in, for this method to really work properly. You should, you should not have any overlap on these cuts. So if you get that, and that's common for beginners, you need to come back in and just clean those cuts up. So in here, I would, I would just take another thin slice off the bottom part of my notch to make sure that there was no what they call Dutchman undercuts. All right, just a couple helpful tips. If you've never done this, the, the way to start with this, first things first, you've got to aim that thing very carefully because when you cut this notch out, that sets the direction of fall by setting your hinge. Most chainsaws will have a sight line on them, like this one right here, that black solid line. Sometimes it's not always black, but you can also usually use the, the handle grip too as the sight line. So you can kind of stand behind that tree and look down at your saw on that gun sight and aim where your notch is going to be made. And it's, it's always easier, at least in my opinion, to make that first cut from the top. So start by cutting downward on that top side and then you can clean it up and match it from the bottom. That's an easier way to make that cut. It should look just like this. That's, that's the way that, you, that guy's standing behind that tree or alongside it where he can look out and aim that tree and then he's making that cut from the top. All right, there's a couple things just to know about the hinge itself. The hinge right here, that's, that's a nice looking hinge. We can, you can read a lot after you've practiced this method by, by looking at the stumps. Uh, the length of the hinge, again, 80% of the diameter, and the thickness of it should be 10% of the DBH. So if you're dropping trees that are typically between 10 and 20 inch diameters, you should have that hinge about one to two inches thick. All right. This is the trickiest part, doing this bore cut. Um, again, position yourself on the good side of the tree, just for safety reasons. Be very, very careful not to accidentally cut through your hinge or cut off. So you've got to move back just a little ways from where that hinge is. And then you're going to use what's called the attack corner of that tip of your chainsaw bar. So when you work a chainsaw, there's just natural reactive forces that come into play. You get a pushing sensation when you cut with the top of the bar from underneath the log. You get a pulling sensation when you cut with the bottom of the bar coming down on a piece of firewood. And then out of the tip where the chain moves really fast around that end, you have what's called this kickback corner. That's that red zone. You, you pretty much never want to touch the tip of that bar in that spot as that chain's moving on a piece of wood. That's what causes kickback, which can happen at a real, real, real fast rotation. So this bottom corner out of the tip is the safe part to initiate that bore cut. And once you get that tip buried in there, just like that, then you can bring that saw around and use the front end of that bar to, to finish off the rest of that plunge cut. <coughs> and again, you, then you can square up that hinge to make sure it's uniform. This one has to be made. You can't really, um, you can't come in here with shaky confidence when you're doing the bore cut. You've got to rev that saw up pretty good to full RPMs in order for that, that bore cut to work. Uh, you want to be on the level with your, your bore cut that goes through to set that hinge should be level to your notch. And practice makes perfect. This is a scene out of one of these game of logging programs where we get 15 participants who have never done this before and we spend a lot of time practicing all, all these cuts. Cutting out that notch, matching up those cuts, doing the bore cut, and so forth. And so you think, man, that, that is an awful lot <laughs> just to drop a tree in the direction that it's already leaning anyways, right? I came here to learn you know, how, to, um, how to drop trees the opposite way. But this is, this is where it starts. And what you realize when you master these cuts is you can do them really, really fast. It just takes practice. And you'll get to the point where you're doing them all the time. It's not taking you that much longer. And you're way, way, way safer because of it. 
So why bother with it? This, this is a safety issue and it's a wood recovery issue because if you're dropping trees and they're barber chairing, um, you're not going to get as much lumber out of them if that was your use. You can still burn them for firewood. But that directional accuracy is going to give you better production and less damage to your other trees. All right, so what, if, what, if, what about wedging? So wedging, when I talk about wedging, I'm talking about those little plastic wedges that you buy at the chainsaw shop, and those allow you to drop a tree opposite of its natural direction. How do we drop trees against their natural lean? In Sweden, which is where I think this photo came from, this guy just cut a big chunk of wood out of his tree and inserted a bottle jack into the tree, and he's just gonna jack it over that way. So you could do that, <laughs> but assuming you're not gonna do that, and assuming you don't have a tractor with a winch, or like loggers have a, a skitter that they can correct and compensate for mistakes, um, to say the least, it, it gets a little complicated. The laws of physics come into play. It depends on the amount, how much that tree's leaning, and some other variables. So for instance, trees that are really tall and skinny, you can, you can use little plastic wedges to fell them against their natural lean more easily than you can trees that are short and squat. And that's just physics. If you think about raising a tree one inch at your waist, at that height, one inch down here on a tall tree is about you know, eight inches or 12 inches up high at the top. So that's where the physics come in. A tree that's really short and wide is, is harder to use wedges to bring over. And they, at the advanced trainings you go to, they'll teach you how to really figure this out. What are your limitations on felling trees against their natural lean? And you gotta figure out how many feet of lean each tree has. This one has three feet of lean, back lean. Uh, you gotta figure out, based on its diameter and its height, how many segments are involved in which eventually leads you to calculations of how many inches of lift you're gonna need at breast height in order to bring that tree back over the opposite direction. So it, it's fairly complex. But just to give you the basics idea, uh, basic ideas here, all right, number one, you're gonna set up your notch, your hinge, and your holding wood just like I previously explained, just the same way. So imagine this tree right here wants to fall to the right this way, but we want to bring it over to the left this way. Here's your notch, nice wide angle, no bypass. There's your hinge right in there holding that tree up, and then there's holding wood in the back. So the, the, the core has been hollowed out by that bore cut. All right, you take two wedges, and you're going to put them in towards the back of that bore cut, pound them in until they're super tight, one on each side of the tree, one here, and then there'd be one on the back side. And by pounding those in super tight, that tree is basically propped up on those wedges. And then what you can do is just come in and go ahead and finish the back cut off, cut that holding wood. And if you've got enough lift already in there with your wedges, that tree will go ahead and tip back over against its lean. But sometimes it actually just stays put. And the only thing holding that tree are, are your hinge and your two wedges. And so then you have to actually stand next to the tree and pound with your mallet pound those wedges in until that tree goes er, 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 back up and over. Just a picture of what that looks like. This, this was a, it's a very skinny tree, but it was tall. And it was wanting to come over here to the left. So this guy put the notch in to the right, bore cut the middle, put the wedges in on each side and brought it over to the right. All right. I just wanted to make sure we covered a little bit of the, on those wedges. Um, and what we're going to do for the rest of the time here, is Sharby here? Sharby, are you here? All right, can you give me an indication on time left when you get a chance? Well, you got 15 minutes to get questions. 15 minutes and then time for questions? Yeah. Good. All right, perfect. All right, I think the title actually of this talk was Let the Saw Do the Work, but Jesse likes to mess with me and change the titles of my talks sometimes. Uh, <laughs> But here, um, this is another thing that I really feel like I need to share with people because I'm guilty or, or have been the victim of going out and working twice as hard or three times as hard as I needed to be working because I was using a crappy chainsaw. Because the chain was not sharp, it was too dull, or the air cleaner wasn't right, and the carburetor wasn't set right. Um, and man, it's just nothing, uh, nothing but hard work when your chain's not set up right. And so when you go out to the woods and, and work, you should be having fun. And, and having a, a well-sharpened chain is all about that. So there's a really good article I want to point you towards. It, it, you can get it for free online. 
in a publication called Nebraska Timber Talk. Nebraska Timber Talk, if you Google that, and in the June 2009 issue, there was an article in there by a guy named, named Dave Johnson, and the title of the, the article was The Chains the Thing. And uh, it, it's just a nice educational piece in there. And Dave's two rules for sharpening your chain, which I really believe, I, I really like. Number one, always sharpen your own chain with a handheld file. And number two, do it often and in small doses. And his points in making those um, arguments are that it prevents overheating your chainsaw. So the most common problem with dropping your chain off at the local saw shop and having it done by an electric grinder or by you doing it with an electric grinder is that if you, if you go too aggressively, it overheats that chain and then it loses its temper. And that's when you get those chains that look like they're blue and burned and scorched. And when you've lost the temper on that chain, it doesn't hold its sharpness very long anymore. So by using a hand file and doing it often, but with small doses, you keep your chain nice and sharp all the time and you don't risk burning it. So it, it saves you money and time because you know, even though it's cheap to drop, you drop your chain off, it's like five bucks to get it sharpened. <coughs> but if, if they mess it up and you gotta keep going back time and time again, and then you're out in the woods and you don't have a sharp chain and your only option is to quit for the day and, and drive to town and get that chain sharpened again. So it's a skill that you really should take the time to learn. All right, so in order to learn that, you gotta understand how it works. How does the chain work? And there's basically two parts to the chain that matter. One is the cutter, which is right here, and the other is called the depth gauge, or what most people call the raker. The cutter is what's actually sharp on your chain, and that's what's actually cutting the wood. The depth gauge is just what keeps the saw from ripping your arm off when you, when you cut into it. Because if you look at this picture right here, see how the cutter is taking off this nice little slice of wood? But it's the depth gauge that's holding it in place. That, that's what prevents the cutter from digging down, 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 down and ripping your arm off. So it's just this thin little strip and you can see then it's, it's the distance between the cutter and that depth gauge that defines how much wood gets peeled off with each cut. So that's called your depth gauge setting. So here's the top of the raker, there's the top of the cutter, and it's this distance right here, that, that's what's deciding how much wood we're cutting off. That's important because if, um, if you were, well, I'll just explain it as I go. Sharpening then, it, all you're really doing is just trying to touch up this, this cutting edge right here by running a round file across that cutter. And there's three cutting angles that matter. Uh, they're shown here, side plate angle, top plate angle, and cutting angle. And so you think, wow, that, that's already a little bit more complicated than I want to get, you know. Um, that, that seems like it would be hard to manage those three angles. And the simple answer there is get yourself a filing kit. It's like 10 or 15 bucks, and it, it basically takes all the guesswork out of keeping those angles straight. So it depends on which chainsaw you have and which chain fits on your saw. You go to your chainsaw shop and you say, okay, I got a, a .325 chain or a 3 16 or 3 8 and they'll figure out which kit you need to get. And so then um, you look at your chain from the top and you'll notice the teeth alternate with each one. So up here, the, the cutting edge angles this way. Down at your next one, you can see it, it angles the other way. Down at your next one, goes back the other way, and so forth. Well, there's gonna be two of them on your chain that actually face the same direction, like this one here. And that's what I'm calling the starting link. And so the first step is figure out where that starting link is. That is gonna, uh, that's what's gonna help you keep track of which cutters you've touched up versus which ones you haven't. So you always start with the back half and do that one first. And then you're gonna slide the chain forward each time you take a stroke off the, with the file. And as you go around, when you come back to the starting link, you'll know I'm at the end of the, the run here. All right, so your, your bar, you'll set that down, you'll look from the top. It's got a, an alignment on it. And then your, your cutting uh, guide or, or uh, gauge there will also have a mark that tells you how to line up that angle. And that's, that's really the only thing you have to find is where's that mark. And then you just make those lines parallel and that sets up your cutting angle. And so then you're just gonna push that file forward. You're gonna keep it nice and flat. You hold it just a little bit upward to get it nice and 
nested into the, that groove that's underneath the cutter and just take a couple of strokes with your file and you'll see me fresh metal shavings come off if you're doing it right. And you just, then you just advance the chain forward and you repeat it for the next cutter. You're jumping, you're jumping one cutter, leapfrogging over your alternating angles every time. Right? So you do one, 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 and then when you get to the end, because those other cutters are angled the opposite direction, you've got to do it left-handed. So you flip around and you're doing it with your left hand and going this way. It's not complicated once you've, once you've been explained how that works. And this is the proof in the pudding. So when you're out in the woods and you're, you're thinking, man, I don't know if my chain's cutting right. I don't know if it's that sharp. Grab a big handful of those sawdust chips. And, and if it's nice big flakes like this, that's good. If you're breathing in fine dust, if you think that you, know, you need to have um, tight-fitting goggles to keep the fine sawdust out of your eyes while you're cutting, that's, that's usually a sign of a dull chain, powdery. All right, now another thing to see is that you'll, you'll notice there's these little markings on your cutters. There's one right there, there's one here, and then one back there. And those are just kind of a handy dandy thing. They tell you when you're at the end of your chain's life. Because as you, as you run your file across your cutter every so often, and by the way, what Dave Johnson suggested doing was after every fuel refill, touch up your cutters. I don't do it that often. I do it maybe every two or three gas tanks. But as you keep doing, away, or doing that, you're filing away little pieces of metal every time you file that. And pretty soon you're going to get towards the back where you don't have anything left. And that's all those markings are for is to show you you're at the end of the chain. And so what that does too, because the top plate and the cutting angle here is at an angle, as you file that away, sharpening it, your depth gauge setting gets shorter and shorter and shorter because this distance to this just shrinks. And so it, it gradually reduces the amount of wood that you're peeling off every time you cut. So then what you have to do every once in a while is just take those depth, those rakers down a little bit too to maintain that proper depth gauge setting. And in your kit, there's going to be another handy tool that you, this just rests right on top of your uh, top plate of your cutter. And then whatever bit of the raker sticks up in that little gap in the front, that's what you use your flat file to just take a few strokes and, fl and file that back down. And then that's going to reset that depth setting from shallow to deep, or to the, to the proper depth. It does, plus uh, you also end up having to just kind of round this edge, this leading edge of that raker. You may want to take your file and just kind of feather it a little bit so it's nice and rounded. All right, um, it's worth mentioning too, all the pictures that I've been sharing are what you'd call standard chisel chain. They typically come with a yellow label on the box that they come in. If you Buy, if you buy your saw, it's going to come with low kickback chain, which is a green or a blue label typically. Um, low kickback chain has usually an extra raker or depth gauge on the front there that tries to minimize or reduce the amount of kickback risk on those chains. And it does a pretty good job. It's, it's a pretty good invention. The only real downside to it, it makes um, bore cutting when you're doing your plunge cut to set your hinge a little bit more difficult to get that saw to go in, and filing those rakers becomes more difficult because just more metal you got to file down. All right, just some other basic chainsaw maintenance stuff. Um, if you've been running your saw all day for a few hours, it's just a good idea to take that cover off around the clutch, um, clean that area out. You just want to try to keep the wood chips and the glue and the oil and all that stuff away from that clutch and keep it nice and clean. And then right in here is your oiler mechanism. That's what puts oil out onto the bar. So you want to keep make sure that area is clean and clear. As you've got your bar off the chain, you're going to just be aware that there are some issues that can arise over time with your bar that can uh, cause problems. So just keep an eye on that. I won't go into de detail on how to correct that. It's a little bit more advanced. But these things can happen and um, can cause issues. There's, as you're, as you're looking at your bar too, there's these rails, of course, where the chain runs, and there's this little oil port right here, and that's where that oil feeds in out of the oiling mechanism. And your uh, depth gauge tool that comes with your kit, this end down here, 
it's, it's designed so you can put that in that rail and run it down to clean all the gum and all the crap out of there, keep that clean. So just use that to, it keeps your chain moving nice and smooth along your bar. And then of course, um, every time you take your bar off and you're going to put it back on, rotate it. And it looks funny because the logo is upside down and you think, what? Why would you put it on upside down? But that's, that's meant to happen. Rotate your bar, it tries to keep that wear and tear well distributed. And then of course, if you have a, uh, a uh, light colored surface like snow or a freshly cut piece of firewood, wood cookie or stump, you can angle your bar a couple inches away and just floor the throttle on it and it should uh, spit oil out onto that surface and you'll be able to see that there's oil accumulating and that means your, your bar is properly oiling. And then lastly, and this is especially important if you're a steel chainsaw owner, which I am, they don't, uh, they don't have the design quite figured out as far as keeping their air cleaners as, as clean. Um, so you've got to really pay close attention. Every time, basically every time you run that chainsaw for a few hours or more, pop the air cleaner off and clean it out. You can either use compressed air, you can scrub it with a brush of some kind. This was a kitchen scrubber that I just found that day down at our hunting cabin. Um, you could even, some people, that logger recommended scrubbing it with warm soapy water and then letting it dry out before you put it back on there. But that, that's really, really important is to keep the air cleaner fresh. So, you know, I mentioned steel having this problem with air cleaners and everybody always wants to know, well, which is the best chainsaw to buy? Um, and, and the best thing really, they're all, all these brands that I've got right here are quite good. Dolmar is a really good brand, Husqvarna, Jones or Ed and steel are all very good brands. And what really matters at the end is that if you've got a local saw shop that you trust and that you like, that, that, that's the brand that you use so that you can drop that saw off and get it fixed or repaired as you need to. All right, so you now know enough to be dangerous. Um, this says, remember that time you forgot to think? So you've had about one hour of, of beginner and intermediate chainsaw training. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, st I still certainly do encourage you, if, if you're interested in becoming really, really good at this and you're, you, know, you think you're going to be doing a lot of it, to look into one of these training programs. The Forest Industry Safety Training Alliance is out of Rhinelander here in Wisconsin. So it's probably the best bet for us in the Midwest. The game of logging is more of an eastern United States thing like Virginia and Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, but there's a program out of Missouri where I did mine. and uh, uh, so take a look at the web, there's websites for those and, and it's very good stuff. And that's, that's all I've got. So we'll, I think we've got enough time for questions, right Sharby? Okay. Yeah, Sharby was asleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when you're uh, doing the hinge and you're doing the plunge cut and your bar is long enough, what do you do? Good question. He asked, what do you do if your bar is not long enough to poke through the tree in, in order to do your, set your hinge? Um, and, the, the easiest answer is get a longer bar. <laughs> and that's not even fooling. Um, the loggers use long bars specifically just to help them so that they can cut clear through a tree. So that's one option. Um, but you can, you can, if you can work it properly, you just have to bore in from both sides. And your mission is to try to make them overlap. You're probably never going to hit them perfectly. But what one trick you can know is, um, angle the bar just downward a little bit when you're plunging in and that will almost guarantee that they cross and so you won't have any disconnected wood on the inside of that tree so just angle it down a little bit do your best to try to match them up and that's that's all you can do if a tree is uh, too thin to do a bore cut then you just uh, do your hinge yeah, for really skinny trees that you don't have enough space to make a notch and a bore, and then I just usually cut out a notch in the direction I want it to go, and then cut from the back, which is what they call a chase cut. And you know, usually trees that skinny are hopefully not tall enough to really inflict a lot of damage. I'm going to come to here. Um, how often did you say you file the rakers? You do the, you do the cutters every like three? Good, good question. She asked, how often do you file the rakers? Because I didn't say. Because the cutters, you would try to touch up maybe every three tanks of gas. But the rakers are going to be more like every 15 or 20 times that you sharpen the cutters. It's really not very often. 
Just depends on how much metal you're taking off each time you cut. Do you ever take down a, a tree that has another one leaning on it? Is that the Widowmaker? It's got downward pressure on the tree you're taking down, so you're not sure how fast it'll fall or what direction it might go. He's asking about taking a tree down that's got another tree leaned on it, right? Right. And I, I don't think, I, I, well, I wouldn't say I've never done it. Um, but you got, as long as that tree is, the tree that you're cutting is going to fall away from where you're trying to get away from, right. it can be done. But, you know, if, if, the, if the leaning tree is coming at the same direction that your tree needs to go, and they're both in line with one another, so they're going to domino, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even try it. So the tree came down yeah, faster. There's a trick I didn't explain. When, you know how I said when, so you've cut out the notch, and then you bore cut, plunge cut the middle out, and you've got a hinge there, and you left your holding wood in the back. And I said you'd come in from the back on the same level horizontal plane from behind the tree. If you actually come down about two or three inches on that back cut, it's like the, like the back of a chair, um, that tree will release more slowly. And this is for trees that have a real hard lean. Trees that are really leaning hard release so fast, they, they just they, they pop and they're down, and you're still standing there, and so they're real dangerous. Um, if you come down a couple inches on your back cut, it will help slow down that release and give you more time to get away. So on a tree that's propped up one on the other and you're afraid it's going to go down fast, that, that might help a little bit. you have a website that summarizes your presentation today? He asked if I have a website. Uh, this, pre this whole presentation will be, is, is available online, just the slides. But otherwise, I don't have any website that, that summarizes it. I think that if you, if you go to the FISTA or the Game of Logging and do searches on those, they have summarizations of all these techniques. Does the kind of tree make a difference as far as uh, whether it's going to come back at you or not? Or I had a brother-in-law that died uh, tree fell on him. He cut it off kind of high and uh, wasn't that big of a tree, but it came back and got him again. Yeah, I think species the species of tree will, will um, have some impact on how fast the tree, how, how well it holds up. But the, the cutting method should be sound if you stick to those principles. Um, how big a tree is too big? You're going to cut it off higher up. <coughs> how big of a tree is too big if you're going to cut it higher up? If, if, you, if you don't feel comfortable setting all the, the notch and the bore and the holding wood up, that's probably too big of a tree. I don't know that there's any physical limitations to the method. I don't think there are. Have you ever used a Dremel tool for sharpening? No, I've never used a Dremel tool for sharpening. Does it? it seems to work pretty good, but I don't, I don't think it uh, burns it. Yeah, a Dremel tool, it might, yeah. As long, I would assume as long as you can maintain your proper angles, and if you're not overheating the chain, then that, yeah. that should work fine. The pro <laughs> yeah, so when you're cutting a tree that turns out to be hollow and you, you bore into it and realize you're, it just sucks your bar right in, um, the problem with those is you don't have your hinge holding that tree up. So instead of having a hinge that goes 80% of the diameter of the tree, you've only got a tiny little bit on the outer core. And you're playing with fire. Sometimes you can make it work and, and you know, you just each situation would have to be differently, but there's no tricks that I have for.